So we are uh, back here again, and uh, what we did last week, um, we made a, a trip uh, down memory lane. Uh, we kind of took a trip down memory lane and um, examined the foundations of our existence. Where did all this begin? We looked at the beginning of time, the beginning of history, the genesis of the human species, indeed, the beginning of all of creation. And who do we find there? In the beginning, who? God. We find him there. And we find him as a creator ex nihilo, the one who speaks creation into being. Nothing needs to exist, just his will causes it to exist. He's the author of scriptures and all the characters that we find in those scriptures who inhabit it. The copyright owner of the entire universe that he created and the only one with the absolute right to decide and to determine and to prescribe how his creation should operate, how his creation should interact, how they should multiply, what they should do, what they should not do. He gets to decide who has autonomy, how far that autonomy goes. He gets to decide where it stops, who can make decisions, what kind of decisions, and when those decisions can be made. He gets to set the boundaries and the rules for the earth, the moon, the stars the seas, the rivers, the oceans. He even tells the waves where they cannot go beyond. You remember that statement? This is where your proud waves stop. It's in the book of Job. You can go no further. He decides when darkness starts and when it ends, when the daylight begins and when it ends. He makes rules for birds and for fish, for man and for beast. Basically, everything. The intellectual property rights owner of everything that exists. We also looked very briefly at the privilege, the privileged position that we hold as humanity. That position he reserved for the pinnacle of his creation, the human race, who would reflect his image. And I pray that we never, never forget this powerful privilege and the responsibility of image bearing. In summary, this is what we learned. That God pre-existed everything. Before there was creation, there was God. Because he is creator, he is not created. So he's not a creature. He is wholly other, apart from his creation. When he created Adam, he made a distinction. We read, male and female, he created them. The ramifications of this is that gender is a fact that is rooted in creational biology. It is not a, 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 a construct of cultural identity. Male and female, he created them. Those are the two genders that mirror back the full image of God. So gender is rooted in creational biology and not in cultural identity. We saw that God blessed them and gave a command, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it. We begin to see a purpose in creation and a direction for this particular species that God is creating. He tells them have dominion over all the things that I have created, all the things that move. In other words, be a core regent, core ruler on my behalf of my creation. Because we are image bearers, therefore, one of the implications of this 
is that we have intrinsic worth in ourselves. We have intrinsic self-worth. Our worth is not rooted in people's views, it's not rooted in our culture, it's not rooted in our opinions. Our worth is rooted as a creational reality. We have worth because we are image bearers, period. Regardless of what anybody says or thinks, regardless of what you think, in God's eyes, you have infinite worth. Because when he looks at you, he sees himself reflected back. And that's your true worth. Not in what you own, not in what your culture says, not in your achievement, but in the ability to reflect the image of God. That's where your worth lies. Don't ever forget that. You are worthy because of the part of God that you reflect. Something else that we saw in chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And on the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. Because you are an image bearer, there is within your DNA and your makeup the need to rest. It's a creational reality. All image bearers reflect the same characteristics as their maker, and it's not an opinion or an option. It's not even an argument. Therefore, if you do not observe the sacred rhythms of engagement, disengagement, of work and rest, you will wear yourself out. And if you do not take enough time to actually rest, because your basic makeup is that you must engage in rest, a period of rest, six days of work, one day of rest. If you don't honor that rhythm, it's a creational rule. You will wear yourself out. You will suffer something that we normally call burnout, meaning that you have exhausted your resources and your ability to be renewed is gone. It's a very disastrous thing. If you've, I don't know whether you've ever seen anybody who has suffered burnout. It's worse than a disease because there is no ailment that can be discerned from a doctor's point of view, but you are perpetually exhausted. So there are sacred rhythms that we are supposed to observe of engagement and disengagement, of work and rest. Jesus did that. If you read the Bible, he often withdrew to be in solitary places. He was observing his own rule because he was in human form. And so the blessing of the seventh day and consecrating it, and later on, God giving it as a law to Israel. They were not allowed to engage in work at all. Today, interestingly, if you go to Israel, on a Sabbath day, from 6 o'clock on Friday, uh, at least this is what I observed, when we were in the hotel, even the lifts, you're not supposed to, you don't do that like so that press third floor. All their lifts are set on automatic. So that all you do is walk in, it will close, and it will stop on every floor. Because according to the rule, that pressing is the same as lighting a match. You know, again, on the Sabbath day or in a Saturday morning, you'll actually eat cold food. Nobody will cook food for you because they're not supposed to light a match. That's work. They observe it to the T. Never mind that they miss the Messiah. But they still do that very strictly. And they're on a whole different scale when it comes to their journey of salvation. Eh? So don't, don't, don't copy what the Israelites do. There's a statement that says all Israel will be saved. And unless you are an Israelite, please just observe the laws that we teach you here. Okay? <laughs> so, observe the rhythms of rest. It's a creational reality. And if you ignore it, you will harm yourself and you'll burn yourself out. In fact, if you are a workaholic, then what happens is that you keep engaging in work, you keep engaging in work, you don't know what is getting worn out. At one point, you will suffer what we call in economics the law of diminishing marginal returns. You, you've heard of that law. For every extra unit of work you put, your output is less and less and less until it comes to zero, and then you start destroying what you've already created. That's the law of the Sabbath. Um, 
I want to read through. Uh, we continue from chapter 2. Uh, in verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub um, of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man that is the Adam, from the Adama, the dust we saw that last week of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we become living. First of all, we are created from the earth. We, that's a shell. But until God breathes into us, we do not become living beings. And so in a sense, you owe your life to God. What you breathe today is the breath of God in you. And the day he withdraws it, that's why we call him the author of life. Then you do not live again. You don't breathe again. That's why we are supposed to give God thanks for every breath that we take. It's a miracle from him. And so we owe him the breath of life. So he breathes into us. We become living beings. And in that point, we begin to mirror his image. What's happening here is this. We've looked at chapter 1. It's a panorama of creation. Everything is created in the vast array, seventh day, everything is done. So what God is doing now is saying, I want us to take a zoom in, to zoom in into the sixth day, the day when I created the pinnacle of everything that I intended, the image bearer. And so he's going to give us a close-up of what really goes on, of what went on in his mind and, and, and as he created this man. So we are zooming in to the sixth day. That's what chapter 2 is about. So we have activities recorded there of what God was doing uh, on this sixth day. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, okay, in Aden. And there he put the man that he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow up out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man has not been involved or consulted in anything that the author is doing up to this point. Because God has something in mind, he's implementing it. It's like an artist who's put up a canvas, he wants to do maybe a landscape or something, he begins with these colors and he mixes them, and eventually he wraps up his drawing. So man has not been consulted, he's just a character in the bigger play. All right? so, um, so God has already prepared a kind of a background into where he wants the man to be. Our first natural setting is not cities. It's actually gardens. Okay? So if you feel something good when you take a walk and you're in Karura Forest, something connects with you there. That was the original home of mankind. That's what God created. And now he planted a garden. That's intentionality. So he creates a home for us. And then he's, it says that he caused all kinds of trees to grow. Right? Trees that were good for food, that sustenance. So God already thought, what are we going to eat? How will we survive? Right? And it's not a survival, it's a thriving in this environment. So he's already thought about us. He's thought about what we shall eat and the environment that we shall live in. Trees that were good for food and good what? For? You have to pay attention to Genesis. Every word uh, means something, okay? Um, it says, and the Lord God um, made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So again, God cares about aesthetics, about surroundings. And I talked a little bit last week about environmental care. All right? So the, the incredible surroundings that we find ourselves in, the trees, the burst of flowers, you know, and, and the varieties, a billion different varieties, that originates from God. And that, that aesthetic idea of beauty, uh, something to give pleasure. Animals, you know, really don't care whether they are living in very beautiful surroundings. If mostly they are engaged. If it's a cow, it will eat grass, mostly grass, you know, and then more grass. Whether that grass has been well trimmed or it's wild, or it doesn't really matter. It will just eat grass. But humans, when it comes even to the simple habit of eating, it's not just eating for sustenance. We care about how food is presented, or at least we should, you know. Um, 
you know, you can't just come with a pile of something and, you know, we want it well presented. There are schools and about food art and how to make it aesthetically appealing so that when you see, you almost have a wow moment. You've seen what the hotels do. A whole array when you go for a buffet, you know, uh, even, you know, foods are carved into different shapes and just for the aesthetic value. That is not something that is original to humanity. That is something we get from God. He's the one who said, aesthetically, your environment should be beautiful, should be peaceful, should be lovely, and even the trees that are there, um, they should elicit some kind of joy, some kind of pleasure. Uh, so our, our, our ability to seek joy and, and pleasure, that too is not original to us. It's original to God. You know? and, and so we, we find it here. He, he creates this environment, um, and he knows it will be good for the man. Then he says this, in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So at this point we know evil is present. Okay? It, we don't know when it came, but in the garden it's present. And there's a tree either symbolically or literally representing the presence of evil. Okay? So, so we know evil. And, and it doesn't go into details of telling us how, how, how this happened. Um, Revelations 12, if you read it, there's a bit of, you know, um, a flashback uh, when there was conflict in heaven and then there was war in heaven uh, and the great dragon fought against you know the angels of God and there's war there and then angel Michael comes and he overpowers the dragon and, and, and his angels and he hurls them to the ground you know and then there's the song of celebration you know um, there's joy in heaven because the, the devil has been hurled uh, the great serpent has been hurled uh, back into the earth uh, rejoice, O heavens. But then for the earth, woe to the earth, because the devil has come back down to you and he's furious because he knows his time is short. He's on a leash. So probably that event had already happened, okay? So we find in the garden, um, uh, evil is present, represented by that tree that is there. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon, uh, it winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. Gold existed, pre-existed us. We didn't discover it. We discovered it, but we didn't create it, right? So God put it there for a reason, for value, all right? Um, so he anticipated what will happen in terms of human culture and commerce and industry and all those things. So there are things that were already deposited as foundational realities which would be discovered through culture and through interaction with the world. Uh, as, as, as humanity unlocked the riches of what God has put there. Because again, remember, what is unique about us and image bearing is our ability to think, ability to create, our, our ability to speak, you know, and communicate, and, and also other abilities to mirror God's qualities like love, forgiveness, mercy, and, and so on. So as image bearers, God knew at one point we will start unlocking the wealth that is in the world which he has put there already. So the gold... Um, of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are there as well, so they are the precious stones. The name of the second river is the Gihon or Gihon. It winds up through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs around the east side of Ash Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. I think these are put there as a record that these are actual places. It's not some figment of an imagination. These are actual geographical places that existed at that point. And some of them we still know the Euphrates is there, the Tigris exists. The others we don't know, they might have disappeared or dried up, I don't know. But they actually existed in actual physical places. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a story, it's not a fairy tale story. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Okay. Again, the dignity of work, we talked about that a little, that work pre-existed the curse, which we haven't gotten there yet, and so there's dignity in work, because God himself was working when he created the world, then he rested. So there's nothing cursed about work, and God will establish the work of our hands. And if we are not working, then there's nothing for God to bless or establish. All right? I'm just saying. All right? And the Lord God commanded the man. But, but the work here, of course, is 
at, at a stewardship level, all right? In terms of look after, God has already planted the trees and, and the plants, so look after them in a sustainable way, um, in an environmentally sustainable way. And as you do that, uh, I'm sure the first lesson probably was in farming and, and, and uh, I don't know, botany and other things. Because he must have, God had downloaded information and knowledge about the variety of trees that existed, the kind of care that they needed, so that the, whatever he, he, the man would do would then be sustainable. And the Lord God commanded the man, this is the first command, all right? Um, man has not been required to do anything that far. It's just to hang around and enjoy the, the sights. But at this point, he receives a command. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, there's a lot of contention around um, the warning. Do not eat, all right? Why not? And most people feel like, why, why the restriction? Um, but I want to say this. Number one, the command itself is not burdensome. It's a command that gives freedom, not a command that gives bondage. When I tell you, you are free, that's how it starts, to eat of any in the middle. Then I tell you, there's an exception there. Is that good or bad? Let's say, for example, um, Pastor Ted wants to um, make a dash to Naivasha, where he comes from, apparently, and say hi to mom. After all, it's mom, Mother's Day. I hope I'm not setting you up here. You know, he wants to make a dash. Then I told him, by the way, Ted, I was down that road last night. And you know, I don't know whether it's a rain, or, but there's a big crack somewhere before you reach my mahio. So my advice is this, don't use that route. If you want to reach home, if you use that route, you probably will not arrive. So. Here is a roadmap. I have scanned around and there are these other alternative routes that you can use because I know how important it is for you to reach Naivasha. Am I a bad guy or am I a good guy? I have just told him how to get home, right? In fact, I've also told him how not to get home. At that point, if Ted decides I will use the same road that Pastor Charles said I should not use, is it my fault? Is it my fault? Can he then bring an argument? Why didn't you seal the road? I went there, the car is wrecked, but I told you it will get wrecked. You will not arrive. And here are so many other routes that you could have used. Why have you chosen the one that I told you you should not use? Some of you use that argument. Why didn't he just uproot the evil tree? That's ridiculous. That's not an argument. He asked you not to eat it. That's the point. And you went and ate it. You have choice. Why did you choose that one of all the others that you could have eaten? There was no food shortage. There was no options that, um, that, that were limited. That's why I said it's, 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 it's a command that should have freed you to know all that you can eat. As long as I never touch this one, I will never die. Therefore, I can declare I am immortal because I have the ability to choose what is right. Now, the world has redefined for you what freedom is. And many of us have swallowed that definition, that freedom is, is, is the ability to do whatever I want. That's not freedom. That's not freedom. If, if I put alcohol and drugs here, and I told you, you know, you're free to eat. And then here I have food that is sustainable, you know, yogurt, murubaine, you know. <laughs> and then you choose this. And I've told you, look, this thing has, you know, in fact, you're predisposed to getting addicted to these things. Don't, don't touch them. If you touch them, you will go into bondage and you might never be able to, free, to be free. But these ones, you'll be healthy, you know, you'll prosper, everything will go well with you. True freedom is the ability to choose what is right. Not anything. Because some things are harmful. And if you choose what is harmful to you, 
then that is not freedom. That is bondage. And so when God gives you his laws, they're not supposed to limit you. They're supposed to free you to know how to remain free. And if you break them, then whatever you break them and go and do, that is bondage. And you will realize by disobeying God, you are no longer free. You have another slave taskmaster who will not let you go. And when you're finally enslaved and you're in great pain and dependence, you will cry out to the Lord and wish you never touched those things. That you had obeyed God. True freedom is the ability to choose what is right, not the ability to do what you want. If you observe, assume that uh, I wanted to fly a kite because I enjoy kites, you know, and you keep you know, releasing that trope and the kite is soaring higher and higher and looking beautiful as the wind blows and it's waving and it goes round, I release, it goes and goes. You can describe that kite as free because the purpose for which it was created, soaring with the wind, is being fulfilled. But the reason it's free is because it's fixed to a standard. I'm the one who's holding it and ensuring that it soars wherever the wind will blow. What if I release it? What do you think will happen? Assuming the kite has personality, there's no control, it is subject to the gales and the winds wherever they will blow, and if there's a forest on that side, it will blow off and maybe land in some trees there and get torn and wrecked. If there's an ocean on the other side, it will land on that particular side of the ocean, get ruined by the water, never fly again. If it had personality, it would say that I was truly free when I was fixed to a standard. And the standard is the law of God. He creates us and fixes us on a standard of his law. And he says, this is how to be human. This is how to enjoy your freedom. This is how you enjoy the purpose for which I created you. If you let go of my laws, what you're calling free will eventually lead you to shipwreck. You're a ship on the high seas without a rudder. And guess what? You will run aground at some point because you're out of control. You're being shifted by the winds and the waves and the gills. And very soon, you might think you're free because you're in the deep seas, but when it starts dashing you against the coast and the rocks, then you will know you are not free. You will be destroyed. So think again about how the world has defined freedom for you. And think again about how God defines freedom. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The man was not actually idle. He was busy. In verse 19, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. So the man was busy naming the animals. He was not actually idle. But he was alone. Because for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Again, God doesn't come and ask Adam, hey, Adam, how's it going? You feel okay? I mean, is there anything missing? Are you all right? He doesn't. Adam isn't aware that there is anything missing. But God observing him doing his thing says, hmm, that guy is alone. It's not good for him to be alone. And among the creation that he has named, there's nothing that matches up to him. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, 
This is one place where we need to reinterpret. I think English fails a little. If I say that uh, I have a task that I need to do, but it's a big task, therefore I need a helper. There is a suggestion of two people, um, and there's almost a hierarchical a hierarchy of importance. I'm the owner of the task, I'm the doer, but because I want it done well, let me call a helper. And in that relationship, it almost assumes that I, the owner of the task, am superior to the helper. In other words, I can do the task, even if I don't have help, it might just take a little longer, but if I bring in help, it will be done quicker. But if I leave the helper, they don't own the task, so they probably won't do a very good job. So in that sense, English fails a little. And if you're Kenyan, you're probably thinking about the help that you have in your house. Uh, I'll bring in a helper. But the Hebrew is different. It doesn't quite put it that way. The word helper is ezer, okay, ezer. Ezer is helper. Um, a helper suitable is ezer kenodu. Not kemodo, kenodu. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Don't misquote me, <laughs> okay? And, and Ezer Kenodo is one who stands alongside, a companion, a compatriot, okay? One who stands alongside. Now, Ezer is interesting because it's used only 20 times in the Old Testament. And only this once is it used in relation to a human being. All the other references of Ezer are in relation to God. So that should tell you that we need to rethink what we think the helper is, at least from a biblical perspective. When Eve was created by God as Ezer Kenodo, she was to be the compatriot next to the man to allow Adam to accomplish fully the vision that God had given him. In fact, when you look at the, the Ezer in, in, in God. Let me read for you just one or, or two texts where Ezer is, is used other than here uh, in, in, in Genesis. There is no one like the God of Jerusalem, or sorry, of Jeshurun, who rides on the heavens to Ezer you. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and your helper, your Ezer, all right? And your glorious sword, Deuteronomy 33, 26 and 29. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my Ezer come from? My Ezer comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. May the, that is Psalms 121, verse 1 and 2. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you Ezer. So when Ezer is used as suitable helper in Genesis, it's clearly a title of honor, not a title of subordination. I hope that's clear from the scripture. And God puts Ezer, Eve, at the same level in terms of helping the vision that he has given to Adam to be accomplished in mirroring who he is in this world, do taking dominion over his creation, being a core ruler with him on his behalf. So this is ideal creation as God intended it. So then, Ad, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, again, God doesn't quite consult Adam as to what the Ezer should look like, all right? So as Adam at this point has no opinion. He doesn't even know what being alone is. I mean, he's the first guy created uh, of his kind, so he doesn't even know there should be somebody else. He looks at all the animals, of course, they look different from him. So God sees it's not good for him to be alone. I'm saying this to state that the idea of partnership is also not original to mankind. It's original to God. Again, he's a patent owner. And he created the male and female for a purpose. A purpose that he has the full rights to define because he created it. 
So, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Uh, so the Lord causes him to fall into a deep sleep. He took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, he, uh, from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So he does a presentation. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. In the Hebrew, again, this is a poem complete with alliteration and, 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 and you know, how they arrange the poems. He raptures into joy because it's a song. He probably came up with a tune and, and sang it. And, 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 and just by the impact of what he saw was so powerful to him that he responded in this joyous, spontaneous kind of a poem that he sang. The poem itself is truthful in its content. When he says, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, it's true, literally. Because remember, Adam was created out of the Adama, the dust of the earth. But God uses Adam as a final product, as a raw material for producing Eve. Probably accounting for the final looks among the, the ladies. Because it's a, it's a finished product. But it's bone of his bones, literally. It's one of his ribs that was used, and his flesh in order to create her. And he celebrates with great beauty. Because she's born of his bone and flesh of his flesh, from this point we know that marriage, the union, anticipates a level of intimacy that is quite unprecedented, even mystical, if you like. This bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And, 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 as, as, and, and as this goes to complete, it says this, now, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. She was taken out of man. That's literally true. Then it follows, for this reason. And those are the foundations of marriage. For this reason. Because she was taken out of the man. His own flesh and his own bone. A man, a, um, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. So the idea of marriage, its intricacy and its union, everything originates from God. And they, it anticipates a level of intimacy that we cannot even comprehend. And, and it's only in, in, uh, in marriage that after a short while of being married, the person you're married to, they become very authoritative in terms of who you are, what you like, you know, what makes you happy and what doesn't. To an extent where even in your family of origin, you know, they may have to consult your spouse about who you are and what you want. After a very short while, because of this mystical unity here that is anticipated, deep, deep intimacy. And when it is not achieved, then there's deep and great frustration because it's a creation of reality. And it causes frustration because we yearn for it, we desire it, and if it is not, and we'll be looking at that in the weeks to come, if it is not achieved, there is great, great frustration. That's why throughout history, the human race gravitates towards marriage. Sometimes we can't even give a good explanation why we do it. If you're single, you want to get married. And you've had a few horror stories about marriage. But nevertheless, what do you mean? <laughs> You try and discourage a single person from getting married. I tell them, you know, marriage is not all that. Hey, so you can tell me that because you are married. <laughs> they want to experience it for themselves. Again, it's honed in our DNA. It's God's doing. It's, it's a creation of truth. And we gravitate to each other. Whether we acknowledge God or we don't, it doesn't matter. Cultures, human cultures throughout history, as long as we have existed, drift towards marriage, the pairing of this union. Never mind that we lost the playbook and the owner's manual of how it should operate, but we still gravitate towards it. Let me say this in conclusion. It says the man and the, and the wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Again, this is before the entry of evil, and so there is no knowledge of evil. That will come later in, in the next chapter. And because there's no knowledge of evil, there is absolute total innocence, and all that exists is all that they know, 
and all that they know is what God has revealed to them. It's all good. We have little glimpses of this innocence. As uh, mothers in nurturing babies and then they begin to walk when they are toddlers, maybe you've just washed them, powdered them, then they take off from their court and they run away naked, you know, stuck naked. They are really happy. They are unaware that they are naked. And they look beautiful and sweet, right? But there's no awareness of sin and there's no awareness of evil. So you can extrapolate that to adults because who don't know evil would be exactly in that status today. But something happened and we're going to discuss that next week. But here, let me leave you with what I think from what we've read should be a definition of marriage. Marriage as a creational reality, something that God originates, anticipates what I would call a permanent or lifelong, joyful, monogamous, faithful union between a man and a woman. And because it's blessed by God, it has the ability to reproduce after its own kind. Remember those words? Even the trees were created to reproduce after their own kind. Marriage is humans' methods of reproducing after their own kind, thereby populating the earth with image bearers who have the mandate to rule and to have dominion over God's created order, and therefore become God's called rulers. And so part of the blessing of fruitfulness and multiplication is that humanity has this unique ability to recreate after God's image and populate the earth with fellow image bearers who have dominion and rulership over the entire created order. And God, observing this, sees himself reflected in this multiplicity of the species that bear his image, and is able to say, wow, very good. Because it says, and God looked at everything that he had created, and behold, it was very good. God bless you.